An incredibly valuable tool when it comes to network troubleshooting is a packet analyzer, and a very popular and free packet analyzer is Wireshark. That's our focus in this video. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace, and in this video, we're going to take a look at three major topics. Number one, we want to consider what is a packet analyzer? What does it do for us? And how do we overcome the issue of plugging our packet analyzer into a switch port and not seeing the packets that we want to capture. We're going to see how to overcome that by configuring a feature called span. Then we're going to zoom in and focus just on Wireshark. How do we get it? How is it laid out? What information can it give us? Then we're going to interrogate a PCAP file as we take a look at how we work with Wireshark. We're going to open up a packet capture file and we're going to see if we can discover the four DORA messages that we have with DHCP. DORA, remember that's Discover, Offer, Request, Acknowledgement. We'll see if we can see that DORA process happening inside of a packet capture file. And by the way, these three topics are actually a compilation of three videos that I have in my CCST networking video training series. That's available on Udemy if you want to check it out. Just go to udemy.com slash CCST hyphen networking. Now let's begin with a look at packet analyzers. In this video, we want to define a packet analyzer, and we'll also demonstrate getting a Cisco switch set up to do packet analysis. And let's begin by taking a look at a few of the benefits of a packet analyzer, or you might hear it called a packet sniffer, or a device that does packet capture. And although there are devices that are built to do packet analysis, most often we're going to install a packet analyzer software on a laptop, and we oftentimes use Wireshark for that. And the benefits include being able to identify the different types of traffic flowing over the network. We'll be able to look at these packets and see what protocol they're using. We can also identify our top talkers. These are the devices that are transmitting the most on our network. We can identify what periods of the day give us our peak usage. And overall, a packet analyzer is great for troubleshooting a variety of issues. We can see negotiations within protocols. We can see what's happening with the DORA process in DHCP. And we can also use this to identify malicious traffic. It is going to be an incredibly useful tool for us. But there is a challenge in getting it going because let's say we wanted to capture traffic going to and from a PC1. And right now, PC1 is going out to its default gateway, its router, to get out to the rest of the world. And let's say we want to capture that traffic. What we might do is connect our laptop running our network analyzer software like Wireshark and say, all right, start capturing traffic. The challenge is we're not going to see all of that traffic going between the PC and the router because the switch is doing its job. If you recall, an Ethernet switch learns what MAC addresses reside off of its different ports and it will only send frames out of appropriate ports. So when the PC is going to its default gateway, R1, switch one knows that's out of gig 0 slash 2, and it will not send a copy out of gig 0 slash 3. As R1 is sending traffic back to PC1, the switch has learned that PC1's MAC address lives off of gig 0 slash 1, and you guessed it, the network analyzer does not get a copy. Well, how do we fix that? Well, we need to enable a feature called port mirroring on that switch, which says, I want to mirror, or in other words, make a copy of traffic seen on one port and send it out another port, the port into which my network analyzer is connecting. And the port mirroring feature is called span on our catalyst switch. And we can enable port mirroring or the span feature with a source port of gig 0 slash 1. And we can say we want to capture traffic going into and out of gig 0 slash 1 and send those copies out of gig 0 slash 3. That way, as PC1 is communicating with its router and the router is communicating back to PC1, the network analyzer gets a copy of that traffic. Now let's go out to a Cisco Catalyst switch and see how to set up the span feature. To begin with, let's go into global configuration mode and I want to define a span session because we can have multiple span sessions defined on the switch. We'll number this one 1 and I'll say monitor session 1 and I'll say what the source is. Now the source, in this case, is going to be an interface, but the source could be all traffic within a VLAN. Or if I wanted to monitor traffic that's on a switch into which I'm not connected, I could say that the source was remote. But in this case, we're doing local span. I'm plugging into the switch that has the port that I'm monitoring. So I'll say the source is interface gig 0 slash 1. That's the interface into which PC1 is attached. 
And as part of that command, I could have said, just show me outgoing traffic or just incoming traffic. If I don't specify either one, the default is both directions. Now let's say where we want to send those copies. I want to send those out to my laptop connected to gig 0 slash 3. So we'll say monitor session 1 destination, and that's going to be interface gig 0 slash 3. And we're done. It's that easy. And I can verify my configuration by saying show monitor session 1. And we see this is a local session, meaning that the source and destination are ports on the same switch. And we see that I've got one source port, gig 0 slash 1, connected to PC1. I'm capturing traffic in both directions. And the copies are going to be sent to my destination port of gig 0 slash 3. And that's a look at the benefits of packet analyzers and how we can configure our Cisco Catalyst switch for local span, which sets up port mirroring that allows us to capture traffic. We know that a network analyzer can be an incredibly valuable tool for troubleshooting and for monitoring our networks. And in this video, we want to discuss the leading open source network protocol analyzer. And that's Wireshark. It's released under the GNU General Public License, which means it can be freely distributed. And even though it's free to us, it is incredibly valuable. Personally, I've been using Wireshark and its predecessor, Ethereal, for many, many years. And it's available on a wide variety of operating systems. If you're running either Microsoft Windows or Mac OS, you can go to the Wireshark website at wireshark.org, which is what we see here on screen, and you can download Wireshark for free. If you're running Linux, you can install it from the Linux command line interface using the appropriate package manager for your Linux distribution. As just a couple of examples, I've got it installed on Ubuntu. And to do that, I said sudo apt-get install Wireshark. And as one other example, if you happen to be running a Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you could do sudo dnf install Wireshark. And while there is a lot we could do in Wireshark, in this introductory video, I want to identify three primary tasks that we're going to be performing. And the first one is capturing packets. When we open Wireshark, we're going to be prompted to select the interface off of which we want to capture packets. And we'll be given a list of interfaces on our computer, along with a little traffic meter to show if we're really getting traffic on that interface or not. And once we've identified the interface off of which we wish to capture traffic, then we can start capturing. And we can view that captured traffic real time on a screen much like this. And you can go into the preferences and you can choose a different layout of your window panes. But usually we'll have three distinct sections. A list of the packets we're capturing. And whatever packet we have highlighted in that packet list, we'll get details about that packet as well as the bytes that make up the packet. And on a busy network, we may be seeing lots and lots of traffic. So it's important that we be able to filter what we're capturing or what we've already captured so that we can zoom in on a specific traffic type or a specific traffic flow. For example, here I'm saying UDP.port equals equals 53. The double equal sign, that's a Boolean operator that says the UDP port equals 53, which is DNS. The reason it's not just a single equal sign is that in programming, that's how we would assign a value to a variable. So this is a Boolean operator saying, if the UDP port of a packet equals 53, then we want to display that. And this is giving us a listing of our DNS packets. And those are the three primary things we're going to be doing within Wireshark. Capturing traffic, looking at the captured traffic, and then filtering the traffic so we can focus in on something specific. And let's say that we focused in on Telnet as an example. Here I've got a Telnet packet highlighted. And if we zoom in just a bit, we can see at layer two the source and destination MAC addresses of this packet. We can see that the source was a Cisco device based on the vendor code. Wireshark recognizes those. And the destination was an Apple device, again, based on Apple's vendor code. We also see that this packet has a quality of service marking called a DSCP marking, which is a differentiated services code point marking of CS6. That's Class Selector 6. We see the source and destination IP version 4 addresses. We see the source port is 23, meaning that this is coming from the device acting as the Telnet server. 
And what I specifically captured was a telnet session between a Mac and a Cisco router. Well, this telnet packet is coming from the Cisco router acting as our telnet server back to that Mac. And since telnet is not encrypted, which is why we should be using secure shell and not telnet, but since telnet is not encrypted, we're able to read the contents of this telnet packet. For example, here the router is sending the string user access verification. It's going to be prompting our user to provide credentials to get logged into the router. And that's an overview of Wireshark, a completely free yet incredibly powerful utility we can use to capture traffic on our network and then analyze that traffic. Let's take a look at how we can do a packet capture within Wireshark, save that capture, maybe open another capture file, and filter the traffic to zoom in on what we're really interested in. Let's begin, though, by selecting the interface off of which we want to capture traffic. I'll select my Ethernet interface, and we'll double-click that. And we start to receive a lot of traffic coming in, and you might see that we're getting several ARPs, the address resolution protocol messages coming by. If I want to filter that out, I can go up to my display filter area and I can simply say not space ARP. And that's going to stop the ARPs from showing up on screen. That makes it a little bit cleaner. Let's say that I'm done with my capture. Whatever was going on in the background has happened. I'm ready to stop the capture and save my file. So I will do a stop. And if I want to save this file, I can go under the file menu. We'll do a save as. And in this version of Wireshark, the default file format is PCAP-NG. That's Packet Capture Next Generation. That's an enhanced version of the traditional PCAP format. Just to be the most compatible with everything that I might be using, I'm going to select the standard PCAP format, and I'll name this file Demo, and we'll save that. Now let's see how we could open up an existing file and do some filtering within that file. Let's go under our File menu. And I'll say, open recent. Here's a PCAP file where I was capturing some DHCP and some telnet traffic. Let's open that up. And I'll clear off my not ARP filter. And let's say that I want to look for DHCP traffic. I want to see that door process, the discover offer request acknowledgement. So under the filter, I'm going to simply type in DHCP and press enter. You'll notice when I have a valid filter, the color turns green instead of red. Red indicates the filter format is not currently valid, but this is valid. I'll press enter, and we can very clearly see the door process. Looks like we sent out a couple of discovers before we received our offer, but we did a discover offer request acknowledgement. That's our door process right there. Let's take a look at this discover message. If we open it up a bit, we'll see that the source was from a PC that did not have an IP address. That's the reason its source address is 0.0.0.0, .0 and we're broadcasting to a destination of 255.255.255.255. We're desperately looking for a DHCP server. And great news, a DHCP server was found, and it sent out an offer message. Notice that the source is the IP address of the DHCP server, 192.168.0.1. But notice it's going back to a destination of 192.168.0.6. That's actually not been accepted by the PC. So that PC currently does not really have that IP address. And the way we're communicating with that PC is we're going to its MAC address. And if we open up the DHCP portion of this capture, we can see what is being offered to the client. Even though the client currently has no IP address, 0.0.0.0, .0 .0 .0, we're offering it an address of 192.168.0.6, and we're offering it from this DHCP server. We're saying, oh, by the way, here's your subnet mask. Here is your default gateway, 192.168.0.1. Here is your domain name server, 8.8.8.8, and as a backup, 8.8.4.4. That's what we're offering to the client. Now, the third step of the door process is the request. The offer the client receives first, it's going to take that offer and it's going to respond with this request. Now notice the request is still coming from 0.0.0.0. .0. It has not yet assigned itself that IP address. And notice we're not talking directly back just to that server. We're talking back to a broadcast address. If I'm telling the server that, yes, I will accept your offer, why would I send that out to everyone else? Well, if we had more than one DHCP server on the network, 
We want all of those other DHCP servers to know that their offer was not selected. So we're sending this broadcast back out, letting everybody know that we're selecting this DHCP server, 192.168.0.1. And the final step in the door process is the acknowledgement. This is where we're speaking back to our client. And now the PC will take on the IP address of 192.168.0.6. So by using Wireshark, we can see the details very clearly of this four-step door process. Let's take a look at one more. Let's say we want to filter just telnet traffic for a specific host. In this example, I have my Cisco router acting as a telnet server, and I telneted into the Cisco router from my Mac. And I want to make the point here that we should not be using telnet. We should be using Secure Shell. And I thought I would show you just how easy it is to extract the password from captured telnet packets. So let's change our filter. I'll clear this one off. And I want to give a compound filter to show you how that's done. I'll say that I want to search for TCP port. So it's TCP dot port. I'll give a Boolean operator of two equal signs. And I'm looking for a port of 23. That's the telnet port. I also want to filter it to a specific IP address. So I will add on and IP.ADDR, IP address, will give a Boolean double equal sign again. And I'm looking for an IP address of 192.168.0.1. We'll press enter. And if I were to zoom in on one of these packets and open up Telnet, I might be able to see some text like here's user access verification. And I could go look inside of each of these Telnet packets and try to figure out the password that's being typed in. However, Wireshark gives us a really cool feature that lets us follow this stream. Check this out. I'm going to go under Analyze, and I'll say Follow TCP Stream. And this gives us a view of the entire back and forth exchange as I'm logging in to the Cisco router. And the text in blue, that's what's being sent to the PC. The text in red, that's what's being sent to the Cisco router, which is acting as the Telnet server. So from the perspective of the PC, they see this message, user access verification, password, they get a Kerberos message, and we type in the password of Cisco. Notice it's just in red. It's not reflected on the terminal screen. If somebody's looking over my shoulder when I type it, they don't see it. But Wireshark was able to stitch together those packets and show us that we typed in the password of Cisco. We then say we want to go into privilege mode, and we type in enable to do that. Notice here, we've got a red E and a blue E. The red is what we're sending to the router, the Telnet server. And the blue, that's what's being echoed on our screen. Then we're prompted for the password. And not echoed on our screen, but sent to the Telnet server is the enable password of Cisco. This is why I'm always emphasizing that we should not be using Telnet on our network. Instead, we should be using Secure Shell, where these passwords would be encrypted. And that's a look at how to get started with Wireshark. Specifically in this video, we selected an interface off of which we want to capture traffic. We filtered out the ARP traffic that we didn't want. We saw how to save a PCAP file, how to open a PCAP file, how to do filtering with some Boolean operators, and how to follow a TCP stream. 